session panel A is the pathways to achieve net zero and the question we're going to tackle, how can stakeholders in Saudi Arabia and the region unlock the potential of voluntary carbon markets? Carbon markets, this is the critical point. Everywhere you go, you ask people, what do you think is the hurdle? What's the challenge? And inevitably there's many answers, but if I would say there's one common answer I hear all the time. It's a carbon price, it's a carbon market, and standardization of that, uh, whether it be in, in a region or in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in the world as a whole, like we've seen in many other markets. You have the Brent benchmark price for oil, you've got the Dow Jones index, you've got you know, all of these benchmark reference, these markets that uh, create great efficiencies in the global economy. Can we bring that to this great challenge, the greatest challenge of them all? It gives me great pleasure to introduce this uh, panel A, as we call it, and I would invite each of the guests to turn on their camera and their microphone as introduced. Uh, first, Reham Elgizi, Chief Executive Officer of Voluntary Carbon Markets at Public Investment Fund, or as it's most commonly known, PIF. I think everybody knows things now more by their acronyms than by their full names. But nonetheless, uh, Reham, welcome. Um, please uh, turn much. on your camera. Dr. Yusuf El Shamari, Honorary Senior Research Fellow from the Imperial College London, a former research fellow at OPEC, uh, and now CEO and Head of Oil Research at C Markets. Dr. Yusuf, welcome. Uh, and nice to see a familiar face. Uh, Dr. Fahad El Shirahi, Vice President of Energy Efficiency and Carbon Management at SABIC. Uh, Anwar Gassam, Research Fellow, Climate and Sustainability at CAPSARC. And of course, our panel host, uh, one of the sort of pioneers and, and, and uh, founders of this whole initiative uh, of, of Microsoft's outreach into the sustainability space, Omar Saleh, Vice President, Enterprise Business at Microsoft Arabia. Welcome to you all. Uh, and again, please uh, turn on your cameras and we will get started. Okay, um, I'd like to commence by uh, giving each of our speakers the opportunity to make some opening comments, uh, and then we will proceed to, uh, to sort of drive it forward into an open dialogue. Uh, if we uh, and each of them, we keep those opening comments to, let's say, under two minutes so that we leave, so, leave the time we need as we've all I think sets the scene for us. And again, Omar Saleh, please, the floor is yours for your opening thoughts. Thank you, Sean, and uh, Ramadan Karim to everyone. Such a pleasure to be with you today and to have you uh, on board with us on STEM Board on its first session. So uh, we're very happy to welcome you. And for my fellow panelists, uh, I welcome you, Riham, uh, Yusuf, uh, Dr. Fahd, and Anwar. I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. I think the uh, topic of our first panel is quite exciting as we uh, discuss in a bit of more details on Saudi's leading initiative, part of the green agenda and part of their commitment to uh, the circular uh, carbon economy and uh, to the overall reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and to their net zero emissions target by 2060 how the VCMs, the uh, voluntary carbon markets, is going to play a pivotal role. And honestly, as, a, as an Arab, I'm very proud to see such an initiative coming out from Saudi and targeting the MENA region. And I'm very eager to learn more about it and about the perspectives, you know, that we will all bring into how VCMs are going to play such a pivotal role in incentivizing and in structuring the trading of carbon. And of course, the overall agenda of reduction of emissions, as well as actually uh, sparking the uh, innovation around the reduction efforts of emissions at large. So uh, without further ado, uh, very excited to hear from my fellow co-panelists and welcome again on board. Shukran, Omar. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome Reham El Gizi to be the first of our guest speakers to make some opening comments. Of course, in Saudi Arabia, PIF 
ha has launched the Middle East and North Africa regional voluntary carbon market in collaboration with Tadawal, uh, with, uh, which has been, I think, one of the sort of uh, visionary actors in the region as a, as a capital market authority to uh, play a very pivotal role as a convener, as a conduit for this transformation. Reham, your opening comments, please. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you, Omar, uh, for your comments. Much appreciated. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Sean, that is a visionary uh, uh, approach from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, just to uh, talk about the country itself, the country is uh, on a moment that uh, is a pivotal moment for the country. It is changing. It is transforming. And at the heart of this transformation, sustainability is key for moving forward. There is a realization at the top of the house that this is important. Uh, as we grow the economy, how do we do it sustainably? And hence, the voluntary carbon market is one of the tools that would enable Saudi Arabia, not only Saudi, but the region, and beyond the region, the global south, which we're really interested in uh, uh, driving the agenda towards uh, uh, reducing greenhouse uh, gas emissions or removing it. So back in 2021, in September 2021, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince has announced that Saudi would be, uh, uh, has the intent to set up a voluntary carbon market. And ever since then, PIF and today will work together on setting up that market. We have done a great uh, leap forwards. We have anchored 15 partners who has participated with us uh, last year in the biggest auction in the history of the market, which shows that Saudi Arabia is serious about that. Uh, most of the companies were local companies, be it um, uh, in cement industry. Uh, we had Sabic. I, I know that Dr. Fad is with us. We have Aramco. We have family businesses as well, which came to us as a surprise that are keen to drive uh, and reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, and they wouldn't have had the requirement given that they're not publicly traded, right? So that, but yet they're voluntarily coming forward, getting ahead of the curve in a way. Absolutely. Uh, and that was for, for us uh, such a pleasant surprise. So um, a very uh, promising uh, path ahead of us, challenging one as well, very challenging. A uh, steep curve of knowledge ahead of us, but uh, we're so excited to be do uh, be doing that, and I'm so honored to be leading it. If I might just follow up quickly, Reham, with you just on your thoughts, because of course you have a pretty unique profile. You've worked globally uh, many years with BP. This has been a challenge everywhere, right? Uh, there, there is no one place you can point to and go, oh, that's the North Star for carbon markets. There has been some progress in Europe, but nonetheless still uh, limited. Why is that not yet? I mean, given how, uh, you know, how we're, you know, many places in the world, capitalist uh, countries, great opportunities to make money. Carbon markets are like any other. You buy low, you sell high, you can make money, which seems to be, you know, a, a great incentive in many other areas. Why is this struggle, do you think, principally? Well, time has changed. So the, that market has been there for quite a while and there has been a great crash in 2008. But we are not now in 2008, we are in 2023. A lot of companies has came up. We're having Microsoft here committing to negative zero, not only uh, reducing their carbon footprint, but going beyond that to negative. We have uh, Sabic with us on the call and they are having a net zero commitment. That was not there before, but the challenges mainly for that market is two things. In my mind, the first one would be integrity and quality of the carbon credits. And the second one would be price discovery. A price discovery will enable um, supply, scaling supply, which is very important. So currently, by developing more exchanges, most of the trade right now is over the counter. I suspect that most of the companies who buy volunteer from the voluntary carbon market now do it over the counter, which does not allow for price discovery. The reason why we are in Saudi Arabia setting up an exchange is to allow for that price discovery. Once you know the price, then the funds start funneling into uh, project developers to develop projects like blue carbon, forestry, um, uh, energy efficiency, you name it. 
So that is number one. Number two, which I mentioned earlier, which is the integrity and the quality, uh, which uh, a lot of people would come and say, and I'll be very forthcoming, this is greenwashing, which I believe, uh, and I'm stressing on that, that uh, the whole idea, the beauty of the voluntary carbon market, it is financing those projects that are uneconomic without these funds. So why would you go and have, have a forestry project if it's uneconomic? What is the incentive, financial incentive for project developers to go there, if not to cover their costs and make a margin of profit? And this is what this is all about, is to accelerate climate action. One of the tools to accelerate it, specifically for removal. Uh, I would say Saudi Arabia has got blue carbon, but why would you go and restore seagrass? What is the incentive? to go and do that, if not for a voluntary carbon credits offset. So thank at the you. end of the day, I will stop over here to allow others. Yes, thank you. Now, I wanted to get some of those points out and, and get the groundwork because I, I do think they're, they are quite important, as you say, uh, some of the fundamental reasons, the hurdles that we still have yet to overcome, integrity and quality of carbon credits, price discovery. Uh, th th you could apply that to every market in the world. Uh, Let's welcome uh, to the table uh, Dr. Yusuf El Shamari, uh, as introduced previously, Honorary Research Fellow of Imperial College of London and many other distinguished titles. Dr. Yusuf, your opening thoughts. Um, uh, well, thanks, uh, Sheen, uh, for having me, and I welcome all my uh, colleagues and panelists in this uh, exciting panel. Well, the idea of uh, carbon market has been in existence um, since the climate talks has actually emerged back in, in the past couple of decades. And in Saudi Arabia, it's exciting, and in fact, in our region, the whole GCC, it's exciting to see the voluntary carbon market being launched by the PIF. So under the 2030 vision, certainly the push towards a clean agenda and the environmental sustainability has been much faster um, compared to the, um, let's say, between, uh, the, the past uh, 10 years. So, uh, the, but the, uh, here, of course, definitely there are some hurdles and definitely here, there has been exciting uh, projects announced by the kingdom, including the uh, ambitious CCS, CCUS project uh, to be built in Jubail with a cap starting capacity of capturing 9 million tonne of CO2 per annum um, within the uh, within the next few years, and that could will rise to something like 44 million ton by uh, 20 uh, would be with around 2030. So I think the uh, the momentum is quite high, but definitely here with the the challenge which continues to exist in our region and in fact globally is the the uh, the the need for a sustainable business model. Um, uh, and that will definitely not just related to the conventional approach of capturing CO2 using conventional processes, but also the direct capture of carbon from air. Uh, and here there is the, uh, the so the uncertainty here lies around the, uh, the business model, but also some of the development of a new technology. And these technologies would really focus on the, especially on how low the cost can go down with capturing carbon directly from air. I understand that the co current cost is around $600 per ton, and that is expected to go down to $200 per ton with conventional or expected normal uh, decline in cost with, uh, with time. Um, that could lead to um, a, a price of oil, if you would like to look at how would that reflect on the price of oil, to something like $140 price of oil if you would like to capture to uh, remove all the carbon or to decarbonize all fossil uh, 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 certainly a, a a rewarding number if you like from the point of view of incentive uh, from the 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 technology moving in the right direction let's welcome from industry of course which is kind of where the rubber meets the road a little bit in this point at the end of the day uh dr fahad al shahiri vice president of energy efficiency and carbon management at sabic we welcome your opening thoughts on this subject and 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 the carbon markets is that something industry is embracing will embrace uh, the predictability the transparency that it that it brings dr fahad we welcome your thoughts uh, thank you very much and uh, let me first uh, congratulate uh, you for the new establishment of the Estidam uh, board. 
I think this is uh, something uh, uh, very good and in the right direction with the current momentum and the focus on the uh, sustainability. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, welcome uh, my colleagues in the, uh, the panel and Ramadan Mubarak uh, too. Uh, I, I think if you look at the current uh, challenges that are facing the industry, uh, there are a couple of uh, drivers that uh, pay, I mean, challenging the industry to act uh, fast in, 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 in uh, uh, addressing the climate uh, challenges uh, or the climate change challenges. Uh, I think uh, regulations and commitment, and we can see now almost all the country, they announced their uh, ambition as well as the target. And there are some countries where uh, you might think that they will be hesitant or, or not announcing. So almost now all the uh, uh, countries around the globe, they announced their commitment. So this is creating a kind of or increasing pressure from uh, regulation and uh, compliance point of view uh, globally. Uh, also, the customers uh, now they are start demanding and looking and asking uh, about uh, the product that they are buying from you, uh, asking you know at minimum uh, what is the carbon footprint of uh, your product, what is your ambition, what is your plan to reduce it, can you offer for example net uh, or uh, carbon neutral products or uh, uh, low carbon um, uh, footprint products. Uh, so this is another another uh, another angle. Uh, if you look at the uh, even the uh, financial institutes and you know availability of funds and and uh, supporting uh, growth, uh, they are becoming now very careful when they are uh, providing funds or funding uh, projects for uh, growth in the uh, uh, industry. In addition, uh, as as mentioned from with uh, my colleagues, is about the uh, technology and innovation and the uh, disruption that uh, potentially could happen and that could, could change uh, the landscape of our uh, industry. And if you are not proactive enough, uh, I think it will be uh, uh, you will be behind and maybe you will be out of the game uh, totally. So well, you might de you might have access to your market, right? We're seeing that already in aluminium, uh, mm -hmm. high carbon aluminium. If you're not mitigating, you're you're losing economic opportunity. True. So so I think if, if I just uh, maybe zoom in into Saudi Arabia, which is I think started uh, during the G20, where we work with the Ministry of Energy and the rest of the uh, stakeholder uh, to develop the concept of circular carbon economy which is getting the support from the G20, uh, uh, which is something uh, I believe this is the right uh, framework or platform if you want to address the climate change with the four R's, which is the uh, reduce, uh, the uh, reuse, uh, the recycle, and uh, the uh, remove. The good things about it is it's not biased to any options and uh, uh, creating a kind of a platform that you can pick and choose depending on your uh, viability and the infrastructure available for you, also the technology available for you. This is something very important. And from that time, I think the uh, government start to develop mega project, as mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Hashem Raymond, that uh, about the CCUS, which is one of the uh, major projects announced uh, during the Saudi Green Initiative uh, for the sequestration of uh, something like 9 million ton of, of CO2, in addition to the energy mix in, in Saudi Arabia and improving by the 2030. So there are great momentum and, and, and efforts from the industry as well as even from the, 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 the government and everyone uh, excited and want to leverage and utilize uh, all those, uh, all these uh, initiatives going forward. That's now, said. let me just introduce our last speaker, if you don't mind, Dr. Fada, because I do want to come back to that point. Uh, let's welcome Anwar Ghassim, Research Fellow at Climate and Sustainability at CAPSARC, another great research institution in Riyadh, uh, for Anwar's opening thoughts. Anwar is an energy and environment economist 
uh, with obviously a strong engineering background. So we welcome, Anwar, your opening thoughts. Again, pathway to achieve net zero. How can stakeholders in Saudi Arabia and the region unlock the potential? And I think that's a key part of this discussion of voluntary carbon markets. Please, Anwar. Thank you, Sean. Ramadan Mubarak, everyone. Delighted to be here with my fellow panelists and some familiar faces as well. Um, I'd like to take a step back and talk about the um, what Saudi Arabia has been doing. So the general theme in Saudi Arabia has been all about turning climate ambitions into actions. We all know about the net zero ambition, uh, 2060 net zero ambition announced by the Saudi government. There's also the big NDC target, which is to reduce, remove and avoid 278 million tons of CO2 emissions annually by 2030. So that's really I mean, just to give context to that number, that's almost half of what emissions are in Saudi Arabia today. So that's a really big, big target. That's an annual target. It's an annual target. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And with that target, you have a lot of policies and actions that are happening today to achieve that target. You have a lot of things happening, for example, in energy efficiency. There's the Saudi Energy Efficiency Center with a lot of efforts for improving energy efficiency in the buildings, industrial and transport sector. When it comes to the power sector, you have, of course, the ambitious target to generate 50% of renewable uh, of electricity from renewables by 2030. And there have been a lot of renewable projects coming up over the last couple of years in Saudi Arabia. Now, there are also lots of different programs and national strategies. For example, there's the Circular Carbon Economy National Program or CCE National Program. Uh, Fahad has already talked about the CCE framework, which was endorsed at the 2020 G20 meeting here in Riyadh. And all of these things are happening right now in Saudi Arabia. Now, even if you take a step down to the corporate level, you have big companies like Sabic and Saudi Aramco and Madden that have been setting net zero targets. You have the Giga projects, um, Neom and Red Sea Global, where sustainability is really a key pillar and at the center of these Giga projects. So what all of this means is that the potential supply and demand for voluntary carbon credits in Saudi Arabia and the GCC region is huge. And I think Saudi Arabia can really leverage all of these things and, and its position and position itself as a leader in voluntary carbon markets. Riham, I wanted to come back again to, to the points you were making there and just address the the sort of regional position on this. Are, are, are they Because one of the things that were mentioned there earlier standard that the global compliance because you don't want to be yeah, is cut off. so if you would repeat the question again sorry okay uh, i was just saying that the to, to look at the idea of this as a saudi market a carbon market for for the for one country whether this example of this discussion that is saudi arabia and of course pif has come together with some of your principal uh, institutions and corporations, uh, uh, including uh, Sabic, Aramco uh, and others. But my question is, how important is it that this has a regional buy-in uh, versus a national one? And, and, and Dr. Fad referenced the fact there of, you know, the global. So you, you don't want to be disadvantaged by uh, being burdened by obligations domestically that your competitors are not burdened by in other markets. So I'm just wondering, from the point of view of the development of the Saudi voluntary carbon market, how that needs to be cognizant and integrated with at least a regional play or even wider. Uh, well, I'll, uh, I like this question a lot and I'll start by global and then I'll zoom into the region. Well, climate change is a global dilemma. It's not even a country level or a regional. Uh, in terms of regional one, if you look at the World Bank, uh, they have announced, uh, they have published a paper talking about the impact on GDP per country by 2050 by region. And by far, our region is one of the most uh, countries impacted by GDP, and that's because of uh, water stress, heat waves, and then physical events, but mainly it's water stress and heat waves. In terms of it, we are higher than the global average in the region, and that's why we collectively need to act together. It's not going to impact um, Saudi Arabia in isolation of Kuwait or Iraq. It's going to impact us all in this region. 
So that's why we collectively need to take an action. In terms of Saudi Arabia as a country itself, Saudi Arabia is number 10 in the world in terms of emissions, which is high. And I suspect, I don't know, we're going to see what is the count this year done by the Ministry of Energy, where we're going to go. The economy is growing. So climate action is important uh, topic to tackle as we grow the economy and hence the voluntary carbon market. How do we connect regionally? When we set up the market, we did not set up the market as an exchange. We have three business lines, one which is an advisory services, another one which is the exchange for price discovery, but the third one which is the most important is an investment fund to invest in projects within Saudi and beyond Saudi shores uh, for supply, scaling supply and accelerating climate action. So we're not doing it on the ground only in Saudi, but we're going beyond Saudi to Africa and in the MENA region as well. Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, certainly uh, moving moving in that direction. Dr. Youssef, just taking up on that, obviously you have worked many years with OPEC and the, the idea of this uh, this evolution, if you like, from the point of view of the, the, the opportunity and challenge that it presents to the whole uh, of the group. I'm wondering, is there, again, taking that wider perspective, that carbon market, that, that carbon trading opportunity, is that something that is 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 a vehicle of of cooperation within OPEC and within the wider circle beyond the kingdom. Uh, well, uh, that is a very interesting question, Sheen. And if you look at uh, OPEC countries, um, you would see many of them uh, coming from the GCC, and almost all GCC countries have a pledge to become net zero, uh, with the exception of uh, Qatar. Uh, which is definitely not a uh, formal OPEC uh, member. Uh, but uh, if you look at other members, uh, including uh, Iraq or, or, or countries in North Africa or uh, even in uh, Asia, I th think that there is the momentum to move away from uh, the dependence on oil as a major source of economy. So the um, business of uh, carbon trading and the move of the, uh, let's say the clean development agenda, the, the move towards renewables, is on the agenda among all OPEC countries. And I think here the GCC countries are taking an important lead. Why? Because um, they are some of the strongest economies in the, um, in the as members of the organizations, and they also have the capital the capital to invest in these uh, projects compared to many of other uh, OPEC countries. So I think the, uh, what, we, what you see and the GCC happen, happening definitely will have a knock-on effect on all members. Definitely some members are still falling behind, um, it may perhaps even in the GCC, country, uh, the GCC area itself. But um, I think it is an, an, an area or it's, it's, a, it's something or a priority that all countries will have to focus on at some point because OPEC looks at oil demand to peak by 2035 and its latest uh, world oil outlook. So certainly that will send a, a signal that OPEC countries will have to move away from oil as a major source of economy. I have to also think about their own domestic economies from the point of view of the pricing structure that voluntary carbon markets bring. Dr. Fad, I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, when you look at this from an industrial perspective, uh, and obviously there's the national perspective, Saudi Arabia can benefit. How can industry, and in this case, Saudi industry, benefit uh, from voluntary carbon markets? Is, is, it a, is it an opportunity? Is it a burden? How do you think you can benefit? Well, uh, for example, in, 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 in SABIC, we participated in the uh, voluntary carbon market organized by BIF, and we developed our own strategy because we are taking the voluntary uh, or the offsetting uh, is, uh, as a, uh, can say, uh, something that We'll, we'll do for non-core business uh, and also we will uh, do uh, for uh, you know the, the difficult to abate or the, the, the last option that uh, that you want uh, to utilize because we will try to avoid the, uh, the concern which is a general concern about the greenwashing and credibility so uh, I mean we have to be uh, here transparent that Offsetting is uh, receiving uh, huge critique globally. And uh, if you can see that there is two uh, markets for the carbon, there is the uh, 
regulated market like in Europe, where they are exchanging carbon credit. And in Saudi Arabia, for instance, I think the, uh, the government decided to uh, go for the voluntary carbon market which is suitable for our uh, situation here. So I think we are doing it very carefully. For, just to give you an example, uh, the carbon credit that we participated from VIF, and I told uh, Rana here that we utilize it to offset the, the, the new building for Sabic or the headquarter in Jubail. Uh, to make it carbon neutral this is the first in the in the industrial city so this is the uh, we are focusing in the scope three for us which is scope three is something very challenging uh, for for the industry it is you have also less control as compared to scope one and two so this is where we are trying to position the offsetting and utilizing the offsetting uh, for non-core business and also the last two to to abate or difficult to abate uh, sector and uh, uh, product. So today, for example, we are participating in the in the regulated carbon market, like in Europe, as well as uh, we are participating in, in Saudi when the voluntary carbon market. And now uh, even in Saudi Arabia, and I don't want to take to talk on behalf of the ministry, but uh, there is now a strategy developed and regulation uh, under development for the. Uh, for the voluntary carbon market in Saudi Arabia, who will be responsible for what? I think BIF, they take the lead and they started. This is the great initiative. But uh, this is something that, as I said, uh, we are uh, thinking, thinking about it as an opportunity. And it will be also a great opportunity even for the project and initiative in Saudi Arabia. And it certainly will, I think, be quite helpful in attracting foreign direct investment too, because critically they want to see that price architecture. They want that predictability, which is inevitably coming everywhere in the world. Anwar, I wanted to get your thoughts, just sort of taking that point. What you know are the biggest obstacles to unlocking the full potential of carbon markets, and particularly in the context of Saudi Arabia? Many critics or many analysts still highlighting that carbon markets are quite fragmented. Yeah. Uh, before answering that question, Sean, I'd like to follow Please. up on what uh, what Fahad was talking about, which is at COP27, uh, at COP27, His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, the Minister of Energy, announced that the Saudi greenhouse gas credit and offsetting scheme would be launching this year, 2023. Now, this is a scheme. It's an independent. It's a it's a domestic crediting uh, scheme or program. It's going to issue high quality voluntary carbon credits that are compliant with Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And the scheme has been designed and tailored with methodologies for Saudi Arabia's national circumstances. And it's also been designed to be inclusive. Um, um, it's sector agnostic. All technologies are on the table. Um, um, and that's really in line with the CCE philosophy or framework, which puts all options on the table. Now, so I think that, I think when you combine that with all of the developments that are happening and the announcements made by PIF, I really think that all of that together makes the ecosystem in Saudi Arabia really uh, in a position to become a leader in voluntary carbon markets in the region. Now, when it comes to obstacles, I think it's already been mentioned, but credibility uh, is definitely a big obstacle. Um, recently, there have been a lot of criticisms um, of some, uh, some of these voluntary carbon credits, particularly the ones associated with avoided deforestation. And um, now the, the market has been doing a lot. There's a lot of best practices and codes of conduct out there to really improve environmental integrity. And I think these have really made a big difference. Of and course, there is the perfect. price level as well, right? I mean, the yeah, integrity, yeah. but they also the price level. Exactly, exactly. But, but there's been a lot of efforts really for uh, improving and strengthening environmental integrity in the market. Now, of course, it's not perfect, but I think uh, criticisms like that and 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 making uh, 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 buyers worry about the credibility would mean less demand, and that's problematic because lower demand puts downward pressure on prices, and you lose that incentive to scale up projects in in the region and around the world as well. Well, it's certainly uh, you know the you know the, the that critique. The, this is not unique to any one geography, uh, given that this is something that everybody is is looking to bring forward. Reham, we're sort of getting a near closing uh, into closing comments now, and just getting a sense of of uh, 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 our short time together. And it's only the beginning, of course. Uh, Astidama Board will uh, be be continuing this this pursuit. But I wanted to get your thoughts on that, just sort of following on. There from Anwar, the idea of all of these developments, but yet awareness 
Uh, how could Saudi stakeholders increase the awareness of the benefits of voluntary carbon markets? Because, of course, and the big word is voluntary, and that does require a, a lot more convincing than perhaps mandatory. I hear a mute. I don't hear a mute. Okay. I hear a silence. Okay. Just, uh, just before, a uh, couple of comments, quick comments. Please. One yes. for Dr. Fahad and one for Anwar. For yep. Dr. Fahad, uh, for sure, the journey to uh, the net zero is much more important than the net zero itself. And it should be combined with both reducing your emission and offsetting your emissions. So both tools are very important. And I count the journey much more than the end result. That what really matters for climate. Uh, for Anwar, I can't agree more. These uh, articles are damaging, but it's also driven by your question, Sean, which is the awareness for the incumbents in the market. So a newspaper article would make a buyers feel uncomfortable, and that's a question mark for me, and that's because there are new a lot of newcomers in the market, and awareness is not there. All of these carbon credit offset has a level of uncertainty in them. Nothing is certain 100%. It's a calculation, it's formulas. And if, uh, if you want certainty 100%, then you should move into more towards the avoidance than rather, rather than the removal credits. So these are two things. As far as we are concerned, in terms of awareness, what we have been doing so far, ever since in PIF we started this initiative, there hasn't been a day that I wasn't doing a workshop or a speech or talking to someone about the voluntary carbon market, workshop, conferences, speeches, uh, meetings like this, uh, awareness sessions, Stedama boards. So this is very important to increase the awareness in the Saudi uh, market. This is A, and I find it very beneficial. That's how we onboard 15 companies. And on top of it, I would say that the advisory arm that we have if we partner with some companies like Microsoft uh, to inc increase the carbon footprint accounting, the awareness, how much do we emit? Not a lot of companies know how much do they we emit. Some are very advanced, like the SAP. Well, if you don't have, have the measuring tools, you can't change the picture, right? They don't even measure. You would ask a company, how much do you emit? I don't know. So. Not every company here in Saudi Arabia is like Aramco or Sabic. There are those who are advanced, they know, and those who, are, who need a lot of help. So there's a lot of work on the ground in terms of advisory carbon accounting that needs to be done. And hence, we established that advisory arm to accelerate even, I'll put on top of it one last uh, thought, is for the suppliers. When we say we scale supply, the, the, any standard is very complex, is tons of Excel sheets, a lot of papers to go through for suppliers. It's very difficult to navigate, specifically if you're a newcomer. So that's why we think of us as having a facilitation office to allow for suppliers to navigate through those uh, very complex systems. Uh, and I'll close here. Before we bring uh, invite our uh, host, uh, Omar Saleh, to come in with closing comments of this session, I just want to get a last word from Dr. Fad on what, yeah, from an industry perspective, to put the meat on the bone here and take advantage of this very important year of momentum with the COP28 at the end of November. What do you think is next? What should be, there's many steps, obviously. There's many hurdles, there's many opportunities. But what do you think from an industrial point of view, from a major company, is, should be the next steps for establishing the carbon markets uh, uh, in the kingdom and in the region this year? Uh, would you would you recommend? I think uh, uh, number one is related to the regulation standards and definition. This is something very important, uh, as you mentioned, that if you cannot measure it, calculate it, and if people they have different ways and means and assumptions. So I think the standards definitions uh, is something very important. Uh, second is. Uh, this is a game of uh, collaboration across the value chain. Nobody can do it alone, uh, not a country, not a company, uh, so not a region even. So uh, collaboration between different countries, different regions, something very important and very uh, crucial. Uh, the last is about time and transition because uh, you, you see that there are many things which if you rush things, uh, before uh, having the right infrastructure, having the availability, you see the impact, 
it is reversed impact is not helping going forward. So time, I mean, time or to, uh, a long time to transfer, not to say that too slow or, or, or low behind, but we have to be realistic when we set uh, target and time. Uh, otherwise, it will be, uh, you know, giving uh, a negative uh, impact. Let's welcome with uh, Omar Saleh just to come back in and give us his closing thoughts to this session. Uh, if he's, uh, if you would, Omar, if you're uh, uh, still right. plugged in. Yep. Well, thank you, Sean, and thanks to uh, the fellow panelists. I think a lot to learn from uh, all your input today. I think, as mentioned already, that there is a big room of collaboration and partnership here. And I think there is a big opportunity as well for uncovering new business models and new opportunities as well as new innovations. And I think I couldn't agree more with what Reham closed with as well. We need to start with the initial uh, very fundamental steps of understanding what's our impact on the carbon footprint you know, of whatever operations we're doing across the three scopes. How far can we report on this? How far can we reduce? And of course, as you mentioned, of course, the removal is going to be the most uh, kind of uh, challenging of all. Nevertheless, I think the journey starts with awareness, with partnership, with collaboration, with being open. And one of the things I really like about the VCM, it's launching as a MENA. It's not really taking a national kind of a, uh, a description. It's really extending to the whole region. So there is room for everyone to come on board. And we try at Microsoft as well to share our best practices, our own learnings along the journey. And I'm sure there is a big room for, for all of us to uh, learn and partner through this journey together. Uh, and naturally, that sense that it sits in the biggest economy in in the MIA region. So I think in that regard, there there is logic to the centrifugal force, if you like, the pure physics of it. Uh, we're going to wrap yes. up this session here. Really wonderful, short, as I know it always is. Uh, these are uh, modules of moments in which we can brainstorm together, and we will circle back for sure with these amazing panelists. Reham El Gizi, thank you so much from PIF. Dr. Yusuf El Shamari, thank you as always. Dr. Fad El Shariri, thank you so much. And Anwar Gassim, thank you so much. And Omar, as our host, really appreciate you uh, giving us the context and the platform today to bring this all together.